Stamp. Chapter 23, Murder Was the Case. Richard Nixon and his team looked at the way George Wallace had run his campaign, vote for hate, and felt like it was a good idea to follow in his footsteps. Nixon believed the segregationist approach was a good one because it would lock down all the true blue segregationists, like the varsity squad of racists. Along with those, Nixon figured he could attract the white people who were afraid of everything black, black neighborhoods, black schools, black people. And the brilliant game plan ugh, Nixon used to drive an even bigger wedge and get racists on his side was simply to demean black people in every speech while also praising white people. But the magic trick in it all, the how did you hide that rabbit in that hat part was that he did all this without ever actually saying black people and white people. It goes back to things like the word ghetto. And today, maybe you've heard urban. Or how about undesirables? Oh, and my favorite, not dangerous elements, which would eventually become thugs. My mother would call this getting over. But for the sake of this not history history book, let's go with what the historians have named it, the Southern Strategy. And in fact, it was and remained over the next five decades, the national strategy Republicans used to unite Northern and Southern racists, war hawks, and fiscal and social conservatives. The strategy was right on time with the Southern strategy in full tilt and with the messaging being all about law and order, which meant doing anything to shut down protests or at least to paint them as bloodbaths. Richard Nixon won the presidency. In the fall of 1969, with Charlene Mitchell's campaign behind her, Angela Davis settled into a teaching position at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. But the FBI had other plans. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, had launched a war to destroy the Black Power movement that year. And all they needed to cut Davis down was to know that she was part of the Communist Party. Ronald Reagan, the governor of California at the time, had fired her from UCLA. When she tried to plead her case, it set off a media storm. Hate mail started filling up her mailbox. She received threatening phone calls and police officers started harassing her. And even though the California Superior Court would overturn her firing and allow her to go back to work, Reagan searched for new ways to get rid of her. And he would succeed. The next time, he fired her for speaking out in defense of three black inmates in Soledad State Prison, who she felt were detained only because they were black power activists. Here's what happened. George Jackson was transferred to Soledad from San Quentin after disciplinary infractions. He had already served some years after being accused of robbing a gas station of $70. His sentence for that crime, one year to life in prison. In 1970, a year after arriving in Soledad, Jackson and fellow black inmates, John Clutchett and Fleeta Drumgo, were accused of murdering a prison guard in a racially charged prison fight. Whatever chance he had at freedom was now locked up with him behind bars. Angela Davis had become friends with George Jackson's younger brother, Jonathan, who was committed to freeing his brother. They had been rallying. Angela Davis had been speaking. They had been fighting the good fight, but it wasn't enough for Jonathan Jackson, brother of George. He decided to take the freeing of his brother into his own hands. This is real. Pay attention. It's going to go quickly. <clears throat> August 7th, 1970. Jonathan Jackson walked into a courtroom in California's Marin County. He was holding three guns. He took the judge, the prosecutor, and three jurors hostage. He freed three inmates who were on trial. He led the hostages to a van parked outside. Police opened fire. The shootout took the lives of the judge, two inmates, and also Jonathan Jackson. He was 17 years old. A week later, Angela Davis was charged with murder. Record, scratch, repeat. A week later, Angela Davis was charged with murder. Because police said one of the guns Jonathan Jackson was using was actually hers. If found guilty, she'd be sentenced to death. Angela went on the run. She was caught months later on the other side of the country, New York. October 13th, 1970. She was arrested and brought to the New York Women's House of Detention. While she was there, around so many other black and brown incarcerated women, she began to develop her black feminist theory. 
On the other side of the prison walls, organizations were fighting and rallying for freedom, her freedom. And this rallying cry continued after December 7th, 1970, when Davis was sent back to California, where she spent most of her jail time in solitary confinement awaiting trial. She read the letters, thousands of letters from activists and supporters. She also studied her case, studied it and studied it and studied it. A year and a half later, her trial finally began. She represented herself and won. On June 4th, 1972, Angela Davis was free, but not. Not free in her own mind until she could help all the women and men she was leaving behind bars get free. There was no value to her in her own exceptionalism. She was an anti-racist. She knew better than to beat her chest when there was a much bigger challenge to be beaten, much stronger chains to break. Three years later, Angela Davis returned to teaching. Nixon had resigned from the office after a scandal he wasn't punished for, no surprise, and Gerald Ford was president. Just telling you that because you're probably wondering what happened to Nixon. Turns out he was a liar and couldn't, as my mother would say, get over. Anyway, Angela Davis had taken a job at the Claremont College's Black Study Center in Southern California, and she realized quickly that not much had changed since she'd been gone. Segregationists were still arguing some kind of natural born problem with black people. And assimilationists were still trying to figure out why integration had failed. And the one thing that black male assimilationist scholars kept arguing about was that black masculinity was what was frightening to white men, that it was sexual jealousy that spawned systematic oppression, which is ridiculous because it buys into the racist idea that black men are sexually superior, making them superhuman, making them not human, and also continues the narrative that black women just don't matter. Black women didn't have a place in the conversation, though they'd been the steadying stick from the moment the conversation began. All this is in line with decades, centuries of racist propaganda. Centuries of white men and white men, women and black men all working to erase or discredit who they thought posed the greatest threat to freedom, even if it's only, in the case of black men, the freedom to pretend to be freer than they actually are. And what about the LGBT community? Were they not to be included in this conversation? Fortunately, there was media, but not another Tarzan or Planet of the Apes, not another Uncle Tom's Cabin either. This time, just like with novelist Zora Neale Hurston, who had in the past written Southern dialect into the mouths of strong women characters, their eyes were watching God. Black women were screaming with black feminist anti-racist work. Audre Lorde produced essays, stories, and poems from the perspective of being black and lesbian. She pushed back against the idea that she, as a black person, woman, and lesbian, was expected to educate white people, men, and or heterosexuals in order for them to recognize her humanity. Nitozake Shange used her creative anti-racist energy to produce a play for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Portraying the lives of black women and their experiences of abuse, joy, heartbreak, strength, weakness, love, and longing for love. Some people were afraid it would strengthen stereotypes of black women. Some were afraid it would strengthen stereotypes of black men. Both fears are code for the fear of an anti-racist truth. Alice Walker wrote The Color Purple, a novel that presents a black woman dealing with abusive black men, abusive Southern poverty, and abusive racist whites. The tired argument about the black male stereotype arose again, but so what? And Michelle Wallace wrote a book called Black Macho and the Myth of the Superhuman. Wallace believed sexism was an even greater concern than racism. She was loved, but she was hated just as much. And while the idea of black masculinity was being challenged by black women, white masculinity was being threatened constantly by black men. So once again, white America created a symbol of hope, of man, I mean, man, of macho, of victor, and plastered it on the big screen again. This time, his name was Rocky. I'm sure you've seen at least one of the movies, even if it's one of the new ones. And if you haven't, you know the fight song, the song playing while Rocky runs up a set of museum steps, training, tired by triumphant. Yeah, 
Rocky, played by Sylvester Stallone, was a poor, kind, slow-talking, slow-punching, humble, hard-working, steel-jawed Italian-American boxer in Philadelphia. Facing off against the unkind, fast-talking, fast-punching, cocky, African-American world heavyweight champion. I mean, really? Rocky's opponent, Apollo Creed, the new movies are about his son, with his amazing thunderstorm of punches symbolized the empowerment movements, the rising black middle class, and the real life heavyweight champion of the world in 1976, the pride of black power masculinity, Muhammad Ali. Rocky symbolized the pride of white supremacist masculinity's refusal to be knocked out from the thunderstorm of civil rights and black power protests and policies. Weeks before Americans ran out to see Rocky, though, they ran out to buy Alex Haley's Roots, the saga of an American family. Haley, who was known for working with Malcolm X on his autobiography, had now basically written the slave story of all slave stories. It was a 700-page book, then made into a miniseries that became the most watched show in television history. It blew up a bunch of racist ideas about how slaves were lazy brutes, mammies and sambos, and how slave owners were benevolent and kind, landlords. But as much as anti-racist Black Americans loved their roots, racist white Americans loved, on and off screen, their Rocky, with his unrelenting fight for the law and order of racism. And then in 1976, their Rocky ran for president.